What I shall discuss is, uh, first of all, the role of artificial intelligence in the design and operation of weapons, uh, including soldiers themselves. Um, then we'll turn to some ethical issues, this, th these rays, and how far these have been changed, chiefly by the introduction of artificial intelligence into the battlefield. That's the main focus of the talk. Uh, the ground rules. Um, if one isn't a Christian or a pacifist, then, or, or some variant on those, then killing in war is just a matter of implementation, not a principle. I mean, that, most people take that for granted. Um, and we shall, I shall quote several times a, an American writer called Grossman, who has the unique distinction of being both a, um, a, an active marine captain at some stage and a professor of psychiatry. He wrote a book called On Killing, which was a book that got me interested in this whole issue, really. And his point of the book is this, that distance is very important in killing in war. Surprise, surprise. And detachment from the act are crucial to killing in war and to people's willingness to kill and to their sentiments about it. We'll come to some more of that. Um, as it were, um, people feel differently about the bayonet at two feet versus the sniper rifle at a mile or the drone at 5,000 miles in Texas to Syria. Um, there's nothing new about protests against military technology and, uh, the, and the, the quantity of military activity and it being excessive. Um, in the Middle Ages, one's told that uh, um, there was an edict at one stage that crossbows were, up, were anathema for Christians. They were unfair. They were too much. I mean, you know, if you were used to real bows. In the Second World War, remarkably, Bishop Bell went on protesting against the mass bombing of Germany right through the war, as you, many of you probably know, and particularly the activities of Lord Charwell, who we'll come back to, who was Churchill's scientific advisor. He was the man who um, planned the mass bombing of Germany square by square. And of course, he had further ideas, which we'll touch on later. He wanted to castrate all German males between 18 and 65, advice which Churchill wisely turned down. Um, and of course, philosophers weren't always on that side. Bertrand Russell, in 47, thought that, that it would be better to bomb the Soviet Union with atomic weapons then rather than let them get atomic weapons and have a standoff and possibly um, nuclear destruction of everybody. Um, I think most people think he was wrong, but it's interesting that a, a philosopher steeped in ethical theory could come to that conclusion at that point. Grossman's book is extremely interesting. I recommend it to you. It's an extraordinary book. Um, his chief claim, surprise, surprise, is that people don't want to kill and soldiers don't want to kill, and they go to great lengths to avoid killing people firing over their heads, one of his most striking pieces of evidence is the huge pile of rifles left behind, or muskets, I don't know what they were, from one of the great Civil War battles, which have all been excavated, I mean thousands of them, in great piles from Civil War battles in the 19th century. And one of the most extraordinary findings is that a very high proportion of these muskets were double-loaded. That's to say, the soldiers had rammed another ball and powder cartridge down the barrel on top of the existing one. In other words, they wanted to be seen by their officers to be loading, having fired, but they hadn't fired, and they double-loaded their guns. Grossman's belief is that only 10% of soldiers, well, it's a statistic, uh, not just his, only 10% of soldiers do approximately 80% of the killing in war. And in some sense, they're quasi-psychopaths. I mean, that's the people the military really need. The, the rest are sort of ballast, really. I mean, um, they're the people that, uh, you know, the recruiters want. They don't know they, these are the people. Perhaps they do. Perhaps clever officers know this. But the statistic is striking, isn't it? That 10% of the soldiers do 80% of the killing. Um, it just tells you something about people and their willingness to kill. Um, and, of course, our masters know this, and there's a great deal of effort put in these days, certainly among US and UK forces, to training soldiers to be more willing to kill, to up what is called the kill rate, by things like video games and possibly drugs. Um, because in wars in recent memory, um, these soldiers have had a lower kill rate than some of the people they've been fighting. N now our EU partners, of course. Um, the augmentation of soldiers. Um, this is an, a current very important area for the military. Um, it's an old idea. I mean, the, ha the word assassin, as you probably know, comes from hashishin, the, the, the Ottoman soldiers who are high on hashish to enable them to kill, not, not thought to be a peaceful dropout drug in those days. Um, and the extensive use of keep-awake drugs in the Vietnam War. And Grossman 
describes in some detail the kind of work going on on making soldiers, as, as it were, more effective. That includes things like exoskeletons. Exoskeletons are those things that if you wrap them round people, metal arms round their real arms, you can turn ordinary people into giants of strength and speed. They're, they're essentially robots with you inside, except they're human shaped. Soldiers, are, soldiers inside an exoskeleton can run and lift. They can lift a ton I mean, and move very fast. Then we may see those on the battlefield. The interesting thing, of course, interesting thing about that, of course, is um, it, it, makes, it makes who the soldier is irrelevant. Now there are women in the military, as we all know, but of course, with exoskeletons, what sex you are doesn't matter. You could be a dwarf. It doesn't matter. All the old virtues of soldiery, of strength and speed, will go away with this sort of artificial intelligence. And there's another development, which I won't have time to say much about, but I've, I'll say something about it right at the end, which is that the current big research topic in America is um, finding ways of keeping flocks... You, flock is not the right word, flocks of soldiers who may not be in communication with each other under the command of a single guiding artificial intelligence. In the old days on the battlefield, I mean, when soldiers couldn't see each other or got lost or, you know, it was hopeless. I mean, how did a general ever command anything, you think, if people weren't in firm rows? But now there can be guidance systems communicating with a large number of soldiers in a space, causing them to do something together when they don't know what that is, well, in a sense, soldiers never knew what it was they were doing, they did as they were told. But this new communication method of steering disconnected groups of soldiers is a rather a revolutionary thing. It's called in America the dismounted platoon. This is the key word, rather a nice phrase. Dismounted is wonderfully old-fashioned, isn't it? But you know, that's, that's the, one of the key phrases now. For as it were, flocks of soldiers being made more efficient by new... A, a wholly automatic general, as it were, would guide them to whatever they were supposed to be doing. Um, what's the relevance of Grossman to our topic, which is really automated weapons? Um, well, what I want to explore and throughout this talk, really, is the relationship between distance killing and the separation of the human from killing in war and automation. Uh, you see this very clearly in the drones currently being used in Syria. Uh, they're being operated from... Uh, hidden bu secret buildings in the western United States, as you know. I mean, and they're taking out individuals, targeted individuals are being taken out in Syria. You know this. It, it's not recent. I mean, Obama started this, and it was a, it's been very successful. They've taken out lots of people the Americans wanted to kill. Um, they found out from their phones that they were phoning somebody, and a drone would turn on them, and a man in Texas, a woman, would press a button, and they'd be killed. Um, so this, this has extraordinary distance phenomenon, what, eight, ten thousand kilometers, whatever it is, distance, miles, whatever. And, and also, of course, um, in some sense, as we know, the person pushing the button is in the same situation as a, as a video game. They are enormously distant, both physically and psychologically. And th we know this from the history of recent war. I mean, Hiroshima was dropped by a plane that went pulled away and didn't hardly saw the bomb go off when it dropped that boy. Um, snipers have in the last war were killing people at a mile or two, two miles, I believe, the best snipers. I mean, they were a very, very long way away from the people who were killing. This is all part of Grossman's argument about distance. Long-range shelling in the Navy, where a ship never sees the ship it's shelling because it's over the horizon. Um, most of the casualties in the First World War, you probably know, were not from trench warfare, but from long-distance shelling of artillery who never saw the people they were killing. They were miles away. Um, naval war over the horizon. There used to be this awful story, didn't there? You remember it in Victorian times where people were um, asked uh, if you could get a million pounds every time you pressed a button and a random Chinese peasant died, would you press the button? Um, it was an absurd sort of racist, um, imperialist joke. But you can see now that that has a sort of haunting flavor of warfare to come. And I shall point out later, of course, that it's also out of date in other ways than politically because, of course, we now don't feel as distant from distant people as we did. And this is an important fact, I think, about the future of war. Um, AI technology and automated weapons have brought two fundamental changes then. They brought the possibility of fully autonomous weapons, not the drone driven by the man, pointed by the man in and woman in Texas, but the fully automated weapon, which we'll talk about in a while. And, of course, the argument for them is obvious. It cuts down casualties on your side. That's the chief argument for automated weapons. Everybody knows it. The enemy die and you don't. Um, robots kill and your soldiers don't die. And the other thing, of course, once you've read Grossman, is it overcomes the unwillingness of your soldiers to fight, which is undoubtedly growing in Western armies. 
uh, Western soldiers are less willing to kill even than they were in the past, one suspects from what one reads. And of course, robots at the moment have no such inhibitions. The other part of automated weapons that I won't say a lot about, which you're all aware of, of course, is cyber war. Um, this also is a form of artificial intelligence. It's a form of war which has already begun and will become important. Um, it takes many forms. Um, again, it, it, it will be computer-driven attacks on an enemy's infrastructure, again, with no direct casualties on their side or yours. Um, but, of course, there will be casualties. I mean, if they take down sewers, hospitals, power stations, which is what they aim to do in cyber war, there will be casualties, undoubtedly, but they won't be the casualties of the kind there were before. Um, the types of cyber attack, I mean, you're probably aware of this from the newspapers, the things they aim at there, broadcast, radio, TV, power stations, dams, dams. Dams will be very um, big targets for cyber war. Um, phone communications, industrial safety systems. There are directed, um, directed virus-type um, computer programs now that will seek out safety systems of certain kinds and disable them in power stations and in, in industry. And there's a, a, you've probably heard of, who's heard of Stuxnet? Good, then you know what it, then a third of you know what Stuxnet is. Stuxnet is one of the cleverest programs ever written. It was um, designed, no one quite knows, they say, by a state actor. It's either Israel or the US, we don't know which or both. Um, it was a virus designed to seek out and, dest and destroy um, Iranian um, centrifuges for, sif for sieving uranium. The brilliant thing is that Stuxnet, exactly like an organism, was put onto USBs and slowly but surely, with people not knowing they were carrying it, Stuxnet made its way towards Iran. How it's not known, because Iran does, takes a great deal of effort to stop these things reaching it. It cuts itself off from the world internet in all kinds of ways. But slowly, these USBs went from laptop to computer to laptop, and it made its way to, it knew where it was going. It, the, the virus was so clever that once it got into a system, it knew its geographical coordinates and where it was headed. Eventually it got to Iran, it got into the centrifuges, it speeded them up, and they were disabled. It's an extraordinary, whatever you think of that particular piece of warfare, it's an extraordinary intelligent piece of programming. I can't even, I mean, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Exactly like an organism. Uh, there'll be more of that. Um, and of course, the commonest form of cyber war that we all encounter to some degree is, is denial of service. Uh, individuals do this cyber war. It's personalized cyber war. Um, a gang of people can overwhelm a company by writing a program that sends it thousands of requests every minute and shuts it down. Um, uh, state actors can do that as well. This is a colleague of mine at Sheffield, Professor Noel Sharkey. He is the leading campaigner, I'm lucky to be in the same department as him for many years, he's the leading campaigner against uh, automated weapons and I'll just look at his views in a moment. He goes to the UN and the Pentagon and preaches against automated weapons. He's very strong on this, he's made a second career. He used to be a, a professor of robotics in charge of um, research on uh, flocking automata. Think of automated birds that can flock. Very close to the kinds of weapons that he's now very much against. I've always envied Noel. Um, the thing about Noel is he became famous in robot wars. If you ever watched robot wars where those lawnmowers attack each other, you know. Um, <laughs> Noel was a judge because uh, he was a robotics professor. But I've always envied Noel, but not the TV, but because he looks like a professor. He has a white pigtail. I mean, he's, he looks like a professor. I've always looked like a car salesman. And, you know, the, I, I can't tell you how, how depressing this has been over the years. Um, Noel Sharkey's principal argument to automated weapons is this, is that AI hasn't yet produced systems capable of sufficient distinction of competence and non-competence. It can't tell the civilians from the soldiers it's supposed to be killing, and therefore it mustn't be, the automated weapons mustn't be deployed. So it's not an argument of principle, really. It's... Um, is just about actual performance. After all, if, if, if automated weapons turned out to be able to do that, his argument would collapse. And they will get better, of course, as machines get better. I mean, just think of automated cars, which are now running on London streets as of this week. Automated cars have done millions and millions of miles. I still have friends who deny there are automated cars. I meet them at, at drinks and things, and they say, oh, automated cars, can't possibly have a silly idea. And, you know, and they'll be saying that when they're, in the back of a, when they're in the back of a taxi with no driver. They'll still be saying that. I mean, these automated cars have done millions and millions and millions of miles. They really work. And they're, they're here, and, uh, and they're going to be wonderful, especially if you don't like driving like me. 
Um, but think about it. The automated car can tell the pedestrian from the cyclist, and it can see all around it. Unlike you and I, we can't see all around the car. It can. And they'll, they'll cause less accidents, better gas mileage, everything will be better. Um, they'll run in fleets and you know, there'll be no more motorway hold-ups. It'll all be wonderful. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a mad optimist about automated cars. But the point is, if automated cars can distinguish cyclists and pedestrians, I suspect that automated weapons are going to be able to distinguish civilians and soldiers. I mean, I, it's going to happen, I'm quite sure. And of course, there are, well, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, here's, here's an old sharky. Um, he doesn't think it makes any sense to say a machine could be humane. You can probably read that. I'm not just being picky about semantics, he says. Anthropomorphic terms like ethical and humane when applied to machines they can make, lead us to making more and more false attributions about robots further down the line. He thinks it's a bad idea to even begin to assign these words to robots. I think he's wrong. We disagree strongly about this. I think the arguments for automated weapons are very strong of the sorts I've listed already. Um, the, the, the main issue is what he calls the principle of distinction, which I think is enshrined in various UN and Geneva conventions on this issue. The, what, whether humans can do this distinction of civilians and soldiers better than machines. And it brings up the whole question of what do machines do better than we do and what do they do better than us? We know they do arithmetic better than us. We know we do philosophy better than they do, at least at the moment. But the border's changing. I mean, you know, they're now better at surgery in some ways. And I found out yesterday from the Times they're better at filling in the holes in Greek inscriptions on damaged tombstones and, uh, and buildings. That's extraordinary. It's a huge blow to one of my friends who's an expert in Greek inscriptions. Um, the machine learning program fills in these gaps much better than he can. He's not going to like this. Um, it's not clear where the borderlines are. But the main point I want to make about in connection with what we're talking about is how bad humans have been at distinguishing civilians and soldiers. We know that. Think of Hiroshima, think of Dresden, think of London. I mean, the, Humans were not distinguishing them at all. They were incinerating 100,000 Japanese at a time, very few of whom probably were soldiers, some of whom were allies, of course. Um, we haven't been distinguishing the two very well historically. I think it's a bit rich to be thinking that it's an argument against automated weapons that they can't distinguish because we've been bad at it. And are we sure they won't be better than us is a different argument altogether. Um, of course, here's Ron Arkin, who's a professor in Georgia. He takes the militarist view. He thinks that uh, computers will be better at discrimination. He's, and he works in the field, I don't. Um, it's my thesis, the ongoing research of the US, for the US Army, that robots not only can be better than soldiers in conducting warfare, but can also be more humane in the battlefield than humans. So there are forces at work inside the military who think they're going to be better, and they're working on it. They're not careless of this, is what I want to say. You shouldn't get the idea that, you know, the those who spend our tax money on this kind of thing aren't thinking about these issues. Yes, they are, um, very much so. Um, this is not a diversion, but just sideways. I mean, if you think about atomic we uh, automated weapons, excuse me, and weapons in general, I mean, you have to bring in what you might call the government perspective. Um, uh, we know from politics textbooks, the first, defend, the first duty of any government is the defense of the population. Um, not everybody always thought that, remember? Do you remember, I referred to Quaker meeting earlier in, in jest, but of course the Pennsylvania Assembly, before the revolution, stopped, kicked off the revolution essentially by refusing to pay for any defense. They didn't believe in it. Not all governments have taken this view. The Pennsylvania government took the view that they wouldn't defend themselves and wouldn't pay the British army to defend them. So you can take that view. Um, to me, there's an absolute divide here between ethics and politics. Ethics is about, we know what it's about, the, the morality of action and individuals. Politics can't be about that in the same way, because if it were, you couldn't have democracy. I mean, democracy, the kind of politics we say we believe in, um, requires that governments will take actions which are, under some ethical views, immoral. War is just only one of them. I mean, there are lots of them out there. So in other sense, politics must ignore classical ethics. We'll get to that a bit at the end. Um, ignore religion. Um, one of my favorite examples, I don't know if you remember it, it's not quite on the spot, but it's near enough and I love it, is when the Americans were mining the harbors of Nicaragua back in, in the days of the Sandinistas in the 70s. Some of you probably remember the 70s. Look at you, for the look of you. Um, and. Uh, and when we got into an argument with Americans about why, why did they think they could mine the, all the harbors of Nicaragua against the Sandinistas and cause undoubted uh, huge trouble for the Nicaragua, well, they said it's all right. I mean, it was democratic. The Senate had voted for it. I mean, 
One sees their point, but it's an extraordinary idea about democracy that if the Senate votes to mine Nicaragua, it's all right. I mean, it, it, democracy and metics are a, a complex business, I'm just reminding you. The corporate perspective, I mean, we know now in the discussions of Huawei and, and the fifth generation infrastructure that Chinese, the Chinese government may have a different view of the duty of corporations from we, what we do. We know that. That's the papers are full of it. Um, IBM in World War II went on dealing with Hitler's Reich. Um, because they had a whole lot of installations in, uh, in Germany that uh, needed servicing, and they managed to go on servicing them through Switzerland. I mean, companies don't always take the, uh, the view of their governments, and IBM's a good case. I mean, um, who do companies owe their main ethical or any other duty to? Well, we know that in Britain, America, certainly in America, companies like big companies like Apple and Facebook, and virtually all others, the shareholders and their value is the main criterion of, of, of correctness of behavior of companies and what they should be about. It's a quite different view from one that's prevalent in the EU and particularly in Germany, as you know. In Germany, I mean, society is considered a stakeholder in the company as well and must be considered by the company's actions. These are quite different views. When you read recently that the, some Google employees, a group of them, a substantial group, were refusing to work on the military maven project in California, that was an extraordinary departure from a group of employees of a big American corporation protesting, and they, they were slapped down, I think, although I don't think Google is going ahead with this project, but extraordinary departure, demanding of a US company that it pay attention to some criterion other than shareholder value. Uh, and you all know the famous quote from Eisenhower. Eisenhower's departing speech as president, he, I think he, his speech writers, created the phrase military industrial complex. Eisenhower warned the American of that, the military industrial complex will become of increasing power and they should look out for it. And of course, we know what's happened. The US defense budget is larger than that of the 10 next countries down the list by size. It so outweighs everybody else. It's extraordinary, which you might call the vendor effect. And this is important, I think, for these issues because if a government has to pay attention to people who are selling that number of that value of material to it, and if the, va if the material is sufficient value, this must become um, a criterion in what the state does and how it acts. Um, those of you with m memories for sure, doesn't get played much anymore, remember Major Barbara, do you remember Major Barbara of 1905? This is Shaw's great statement on this. Um, this was the great National Theatre production. The, it had an extraordinary set. If you ever saw it, it was Nicholas Hitner's production of about five or six years ago. Um, while somebody was talking, a machine was loading huge four-foot-long shells onto the stage. So that at the end of the speech, the stage was covered in about 200, there they are, four, about several hundred. It was an extraordinary demonstration of stagecraft. Um, you can't read all this, but um, the key character for me in Major Barbara is Undershaft, the arms manufacturer. And he makes one of those Shaw speeches, which are absolutely wonderful and blistering. Yeah, you can see as much of it as you want, I won't read it to you, but just the first lines are so wonderful. The government of your country, I am the government of your country. That's undershaft. And the speech goes on, you can, don't want to read it there, you can look it up for yourself. It's an amazing speech. It's the clearest statement of the vendor effect you could ever wish to find on stage or anywhere else. I mean, with the amount of arms he is selling, he demands the right of access to policy. And of course, there's some reason to believe the undershafts indeed got it. I mean, we know that. Um, yeah. So, once I'm stepping probably a little further out than I should here, because one shouldn't use words like autistic these days without care. You're not allowed to refer to anything. But um, nevertheless, it's a well established research topic by. Baron Cohen, not the comedian Baron Cohen, but he's relatively expert on autism. The autism in some sense, it's almost entirely males. It's tied to some aspects of the male psyche. We know that. Um, and it's also very closely tied to the kinds of people who work in computing and artificial intelligence and the sciences. This also is known. If you've worked in mathematics and computing as long as I have, you're, you're only too aware of this, but you don't talk about it very much. The kind of personality types that these subjects attract. And I think this is an important element in the issue of automated weapons and policy. I think these are the kinds of people who not only design the artificial intelligence, but they do get close to policy. I mean, have you ever watched Zuckerberg testify to the Senate? It's an extraordinary sight. Um, Zuckerberg's extraordinary. Have you thought this thought? I mean, I don't claim it's original. I mean, Facebook 
which now has, I think, a third of the world's population on its books. Facebook was designed really to make up for the social inadequacies of a certain kind of nerdish Harvard undergraduate who found it difficult to talk to girls, right? Fine, these guys need help, of course, of course, of course. But here's the extraordinary fact. Facebook itself embodies the approach and thinking of exactly that kind of guy because he designed it. And so therefore, a sort of third of the human race in their social relations are, in some sense, mimicking or copying or being enthralled to the mating habits of nerdish Harvard undergraduates, male undergraduates. Isn't this bizarre? I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I'm not completely exaggerating. In other words, the point I'm trying to make here is not to slack off Zuckerberg. I mean, I think he's done a lot of good and deserves his money. The point is, though, that human psychology, and especially odd forms of human psychology, particularly, I'm afraid to say, male psychology, are very important in this issue, in the design of weapons, their deployment, and the design of policy. Um, Lindemann, who I refer, or Lord Charwell, as he became known, the man with the, the mass bombing of Germany and the castration complex, I mean, he is a supreme example of this kind of person, great scientist though he was. Of course, the fictional version, of course, is, as you know, Dr. Strangelove. And this film of 1964 by Kubrick, I mean, was an extraordinarily prescient movie. I don't know if you remember it at all. Um, uh, and that's the final scene where Captain Kong, uh, unable to open the bomb doors on the atomic weapon, jumps aboard it to free the doors and goes down with the atomic weapon to explode. It's, well, it's one of the most extraordinary sights in cinema. Um, but seriously, um, the Kubrick movie uh, created the notion of the doomsday machine, which people at the time ridiculed. Military experts ridiculed the doomsday machine. Oh, they said there can't be that, they said. Um, the doomsday machine was set to, to fire off automa automatically um, nuclear weapons in case of a nuclear attack on the states. It turns out since, and you can read articles on this, there are some in your, the written version of the lecture if you have it, um, uh, the doomsday machine was quite close to what was being proposed, designed, if not deployed, at the time of 1964 when Kubrick did this. Um, and Dr. Strangelove, of course, himself is the ultimate, played by Sellers, if you remember, he played three roles in the film, is the ultimate parody of the kind of psyche determined on destruction that I'm talking about. And the weakness of human psychology in these areas is very serious. I mean, um, do you do follow the news of sort of over the years the number of missos, missile silo employees in America who've been dismissed for various kinds of dereliction of duty? There are very odd lot the people trapped in missile silos in the desert in, Amer in Western America. They're very odd. And they often get caught and dismissed for doing very, very odd things. But they're the people with the keys to the weapons, to the thermonuclear weapons. Um, do you wonder about the psyche of men, chiefly men, in year-long trips in nuclear submarines who don't surface for a year? Do you wonder what they think about and how they are? I mean, I, I don't, I'm sort of this Grossman territory. I don't think we think enough about the psychological stress on people of all this and what they might do in certain circumstances. Um, if you remember Kubrick's other movie, I'm sorry Kubrick's playing such a large role in this lecture, but in um, his uh, film 2001, HAL 9000, the, this, this computer, you remember it? That one, yeah, you remember HAL. He's the one who destroys, who wants to destroy the ship and all the people on it, because he's worked out that we're better for everybody if the ship goes down and the crew, no, sorry, if the crew are killed and he, the computer, carries out the mission. So HAL is rather like, analogous to the computer that might be controlling the nuclear weapons and making decisions as what's the best for all of us. And in the end, of course, they managed to disable HAL. But you ask yourself afterwards, I do, maybe HAL was right. Maybe the mission should have killed the crew. Maybe the mission should have carried on without saving the crew just as us liking our species. Maybe HAL was right. And in recent years, um, Dr. Strangelove has come back into discussion because the idea that these, autom these weapons, auto atomic weapons, possibly should be controlled by computers, not by people, because they are not prone to all the weaknesses I've just been banging on about for the last five minutes. Um, oh, yeah, we moved, sorry, I've, I've moved on further than I realized. Oops. Ooh. Am I going back? I'm going forwards. Oh, no, what a fool. What a fool. I need someone to restart the slideshow, how foolish. I'm utter stupidity. Sorry. If you just, um, 
could you restart the slideshow? I was so stupid, I pressed the wrong way, thinking I'd gone too far and I hadn't. What an idiot, and I'm running out of time too. I'm back a bit further than that, back a bit further, back, to, back before how, one before how. Lovely, thank you. That's it, that's it. Can you go back, oh, we had the problem putting it up, didn't we? Oh, we were here before, weren't we? Lovely, thank you so much. Lovely, thank you, thank you, thank you. And another thought. Technology, what I'll call the David and Goliath effect. This is something that's been very important in the history of warfare. Well, you could say since the Boer War. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Boer War when uh, Dutch-speaking guerrillas uh, def didn't defeat the British Army but almost did. Um, the, 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 whether war is moving in a direction that favours, as it were, the defenders and the weak over the powerful and the strong. And in some sense it has. I mean, um, the shift of power to small distributed forces um, roadside mines, uh, blowpipe anti-tank weapons, small cheap things on somebody's shoulder that blow up a very expensive piece of kit. Okay. This favours people with less money and, and, and more distributed, uh, who appear weaker, but in fact may not be. The, the Vietnam War was a good example. Like the, the Vietnam War and the Boer War had a lot in common. A um, guerrilla war against an enormously powerful Goliath. And essentially almost prevailed or did prevail in one, in one case and not the other. Um, and of course, that's the choice, of course, that our masters are having to make. Um, uh, uh, three, three billion dollar aircraft carriers are exactly the opposite way. They're, which can be taken out by a Russian hypermissile. Um, they're exactly um, Goli more Goliath, very expensive Goliath, that people aren't quite sure what to do with, but look awfully good when visiting foreign ports. Um, the Estonia cyber war example was a very interesting one, I don't know if you remember it, some years ago when Russia decided to punish Estonia by a, with a cyber attack and brought down. Um, the, the Estonians messed with a Russian war memorial if you remember and Russians don't like you messing with war memorials, they care about war memorials, so it was a stupid thing to do. The Estonians took it down and the Russians hit them and brought down a lot of their social infrastructure for a day or two just to sh teach them a lesson. The funny thing about that is, of course that's Goliath winning over David. But of course Estonia is in some ways, as you probably know, a much more developed country computer-wise than Russia. Estonia is one of the most developed computer countries in the world. I mean, it could almost have gone the other way. I suspect there are people in Estonia who could have brought down a lot of Russia. But they didn't. They chose not to, probably wisely. But it's, the cyber war is going to be very interesting as to who is David and who is Goliath. It won't be, it won't be that obvious. Um, um, and of course, probably shouldn't diverge into these things. I mean, we know other aspects of David and Goliath, the, the helplessness of the nuclear powers now. They can't, I mean, we're one of them. We can't do anything with them, can we? They cost lots of money. They don't do as much good. Um, uh, the, chi the possible Japan-China sea war. I went to a lecture a year or two ago, and the lecturer was, uh, he was a war professor. He knew stuff. And he was asked afterwards, did he think there'd be any great sea battles in the future? He thought for a minute and he said, yeah, he said, probably Japan versus China. And they said, and what would happen? They said, oh, he said, I think Japan would win in half an hour. Um, I don't know if he'd do say that now, uh, but if so, of course, that would have been David and Goliath. Uh, their positions have swapped on the Davidry and the Goliathry over the last 20 years. Um, and of course, part of this David Goliathry is the, gro I said this already earlier, the growing irrelevance of soldiers. Um, Soldiers are irrelevant in factories increasingly. They're becoming irrelevant in battlefields. Um, all the things we're talking about mean that they aren't really there. I mean, at all. Or if they are there, they're miles away or they're inside an exoskeleton. Their actual features as soldiers are, are becoming increasingly irrelevant. The real issue, if we talk now about ethical issues and war, and we're getting towards the end, um, this is a list of sort of what people think of. If you say to people, what are the ethical issues in war? This is the kind of list they make. Inner ethical issues, inner ethical issues, things beyond pacifism and not having war at all. The detail, um, the just war the Middle Ages struggled with. Could a war be just uh, if it was defensive? 
or, or for the right reasons. The, the Nuremberg Tribunal created a, this offence of waging aggressive war, which no one ever thought of before. No one ever thought before that waging aggressive war was an offence. It was just something you won or you lost. Um, that now seems to have found its way into, as it were, human thinking. Um, ill treatment of prisoners, the Geneva Convention issue, comes right to the forefront of people's minds. Immoral weapons, we brought that up before with crossbows, but of course gas has been effectively um, banned. There's been very little use of gas since the First World War, hardly used at all in the Second World War. So some prohibitions on immoral weapons do work. Um, mass killing of non-combatants, um, I'm afraid that has been violated in, in wars, right, chief row of bombing. Now, the killing of reprisal hostages, all these are things that you might list as to obvious ethical violations, even within the overall unethicality of war. And this is what, um, and this is of course what Noah Sharkey is in this tradition of trying to extend this list of conventions that will... Um, keep even within war, Noel isn't arguing for pacifism, Noel Sharkey is arguing that even within the umbrella of war we should extend the list of what are, as it were, unethical goings on. Um, this is a bit of technical stuff, I mean, I could read this out. These are the numbers that Noel Sharkey always quotes, the kinds of um, additions to the Geneva Convention that he and those who think like him. These are the, these are the methods by which they think that automated weapons could be ruled out by some kind of international convention, okay, by extending the Geneva Conventions. They haven't got anything through yet, but these are the kind of terms that you're reading there um, uh, under which the debate is now being conducted in the UN. Um, what is the current state of automated weapons? Well, uh, Putin uh, recently said that he was going to put um, auto fully automated submarines to sea with nuclear weapons in. I don't know if it's true. It's possible, I'm sure. Sure, the Americans could do it too if they wanted to. Um, whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. It gets over the problem of the iffy psychology of submarine crews. Again, it depends who you trust, doesn't it? And we've talked about that. Do you trust the machine? Do you trust the stressed out sailor who's been in a, can, a sardine can for a year? Um, uh, a colleague of mine called Hoffman has written on this issue and written on the ex recent experience of Patriot missiles a few years ago. Patriot missiles were used by the US as fully automated weapons seeking targets. And it was a bit of a sort of mixed, um, mixed bag. I mean, um, I'll, I'll give you a quote in just a moment. Um, the, other, the other is flocking of cheap drones. Um, cheap drones on air, sea and land are definitely being built by Lots of people, I mean lots of, you know, a thousand, think of a thousand Volkswagens with a big gun in each. Back to automated cars. Think of a thousand automated Volkswagens moving across Europe with a big gun. I mean, that's, that's what land drones will be like, okay? Um, and flocking together, not moving independently, but moving as an entity. Um, it will be very dramatic and quite different from any blitzkrieg of the past. Um, because there'll be, there need be no soldiers involved at all. Um, as I said earlier, DARPA, the American Defense Agency, its current research call is for dismounted platoon. More research on how to control these flocks of soldiers who appear to be distributed across a space. Here's Hoffman on Patriot missiles. Um, you don't need to read it all. Um, they didn't work very well. Um, in fact, the clear proof from the British point of view they didn't very, work very well is they shot down two British tornado aircraft, which they weren't supposed to. Um, so that is one definite black mark in the recent history of automated weapons. That was definitely a no-no. I'm sure they now claim they've corrected it. But the, the birth of automated missile firing wasn't altogether successful, and it was our people they got. Uh, this is the call for dismounted platoon research. This is a quote from the DARPA call for research. It's quite interesting. It calls the development of systems to, quote, take large amounts of information from different sources, including organic platoon soldier and robotic sensors, and create an organized meaningful picture that would enable platoon leaders and soldiers to observe, orient, decide, and act, OODA, uh, and make better decisions ten times faster. This is sort of um, uh, DARPA uh, research call speak for what I was talking about earlier. Um, the, the la the somehow the AI system which will control uh, a large number of soldiers all at once and get them to focus on a single task. There's an enormous amount of artificial intelligence work over 50 years on what you might call, is usually called cooperative work, getting humans and machines to cooperate automatically to do something. It's just this has now moved into the military sphere. 
Benefits of war, we're almost at the end. I mean, we should say this. I mean, of course, there are quite a few people out there who think war wins real benefits. Only, only unreconstructed fascists think it's socially beneficial, but technically it undoubtedly has been beneficial. I mean, we know that. Um, in America, the American Navy has supported most of the best mathematics that's been done there since the war. Nothing to do with the military at all. They just have a long habit of supporting mathematics, um, hoping something may turn up but in the meantime, making thousands of careers for mathematicians. Um, we know that much public good has come from space and military funding. Uh, def high definition TV, Velcro, Teflon, automatic cars, robotics, Silicon Valley, the internet, all these things come from military funding. I mean, it's well to remember that. The internet itself was entirely funded by the US military. Secretly probably still is, but nobody's very clear now what funds the internet. We shouldn't get into that. Um, again, it's, it's, this is not an issue of principle. It's just an issue of detail and the quantity of death and of and collateral. Just for, This is more or less at the end now. Um, if you want to try and bring classical ethics to bear on war, it's quite difficult. Um, uh, things like the Geneva Convention aren't really ethics as much as they're more like corporate codes of practice and good ones. I mean, I'm, the Geneva Convention is a huge human achievement, but it's more like a corporate code of practice. It doesn't refer to philosophers or or, or quote ethical principles. If you know who Kant is, I mean, um, you know, Kant thought there were absolute principles in ethics, and he thought there was an absolute principle against murder. So he's no use. Um, um, he's no use to military strategists because he's against killing as such. So he's out of the door. I mean, you can't make him come to bear. The other great tradition in ethics, Kant is the tradition of rules and principles, like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. That's Kant. And he had lots of other principles as well. Um, the, other great, the other great tradition in ethics is utilitarianism, or consequentialism it's called now, John Stuart Mill in this country, which sees things in terms of consequences. And there, of course, there's a lot of justification of war in those terms, that it's better to have fought the Nazis than not to have fought the Nazis, even though it bankrupted the country and killed half a million people on our, on our side. You know these arguments. I mean, you can bring in some sense. But the trouble with utilitarianism is it sounds like you can do ethical calculations, but nobody actually ever does any calculations. So it's all sort of vacuous in a way. It's just a way of backing your hunches. The, the only piece of ethics, really, that bears on war directly is old-fashioned Roman and Greek virtue ethics. That was a good thing to defend your family. It was a good thing to be brave. That's the way the Romans and the Greeks talked, and that bore directly on war. But that is very much a minor tradition in ethics these days. Hume, the great, other great British ethicist, of course, thought that ethics was founded in sentiment. The greatest quote in British ethical thinking, I quote it regularly, you may have heard me quote it before if you've ever seen me before, is that reason is the slave of the passions, he said. What a great line. Reason is the slave of the passions. He thought that ethics rested not on reason and calculation, but on what we felt, on our sentiments. It was sentiment that stopped us doing things or caused us to do things. And of course, I think he's probably right. But the trouble is, well, the point is, sentiment changes with time. People have different sentiments about war now than what they had 100 years ago. That's fairly obvious. People are, I think, much more pacifist and, and less willing to see war now, partly because, of course, war is bigger scale and more terrible consequences. And of course, had we willed enough in time, we would talk about evolution here, wouldn't we? And, the, and the, this ethics of sentiment is connected to um, uh, who you think are your tribe are and who you think the other tribe are and how you feel about killing your tribe versus other tribes. There's a general belief that you, know, you want to protect your family but you don't mind killing far off tribes. Well, the world has changed in that too. I mean, uh, if you remember the American thinker Steven Pinker, he makes a big thing of this. He's a wild optimist and I, I largely agree with him. The human race has simply changed over this in the last 50 years. We now don't think of distant people in the way we did. We don't seem as driven by genetic closeness, our family, our tribe, our people with whom we share DNA, who we desperately want to protect, protect. We now seem to feel closeness. I mean, Britain is now, seems to have half the population believe their patriotism is European. That would be, I'm, I may, that's not my view, but that's the view of half the country, roughly. Um, 50 years ago, it was a ridiculous idea that you could have a European patriotism in this country. Absurd, but we do. And we know the Chinese an awful lot better than we did. The people who talked about these kinds of things in the 19th century would never meet a Chinese in their life. Now, we probably all know Chinese people, and we watch their TV. I mean, the world is different. 
the distant peoples are not distant peoples in the way they were. Therefore, destroying them in large numbers may be harder and different. And that will be relevant to a sentiment-based theory of ethics. The trouble is, civil wars haven't gone away. Yugoslavs were able to murder each other in large numbers, even though they were very close, different in religion perhaps, but very close in DNA and tribe and language. And they were able to bump each other off in very large numbers only 20 years ago. So it's not clear yet what's going to win out. If you're a pinkerist, you're an optimist. Um, last slide. Uh, just, this is just a frivolous slide. I mean, you know, there's the old theatrical joke that if they show you the gun in Act 1, it's going to be used in Act 3. And we just have to hope, don't we, that this isn't true. Well, nuclear weapons have been used. Never forget that. They have, and how. Not once, but twice. And still, well, we, I think we have to hope that this isn't true of nuclear weapons. Um, we have to hang on to the fact that some weapons were thought immoral, gas, fragmentation, grenades, uh, bioweapons, they really haven't been used on a large scale since World War II or even in World War II, and this is good. Um, final unsettling thought. Um, a thing that struck me in writing this lecture for you is how what a pleasant surprise it is, and it is a surprise, that we haven't, and we're lucky, that we haven't seen more private, non-military use of assassination drones. It really does surprise me. I mean, the people in Texas or Nevada, where it is, who are bumping off uh, guys, ISIS guys in Syria, um, those very same technologies, and those very same people, could have drones costing 200 pounds looking in the windows of Buckingham Palace or Downing Street, um, couldn't they? Um, I'm, so, I'm so grateful it hasn't happened. But when we think about automated weapons, that's the nightmare thought that comes to my mind, and I wonder if our masters are giving sufficient attention to it. Thank you.